video, we're going to look at the basic idea and do an introduction to a utility maximization problem involving two time periods. So usually we'll call that an intertemporal utility maximization problem. And in this video, we're just going to set up the idea, solve a couple of very basic problems, and kind of show you some things to think about. And then I'll come back in another video and we'll do some standard kinds of problems we might want to answer in this context. Now, everything I have written down here so far is your standard utility maximization problem where we have two goods, X and Y, and we have a budget to spend, and we have the price of X, we have the price of Y. We have our standard budget constraint kind of equation here. And over here, I've just written down our, our two standard methods we could use to solve a standard non-temporal utility maximization problem. So our first method, we could take the marginal rate of substitution, which just tells us the slope of indifference curves, set that equal to the ratio of the prices, which tells us the slope of a budget line. Now, again, these two are going to be negative because those two slopes are negative, but I just don't find it helpful to keep track of extra minus signs if we don't have to. So those minus signs are going to cancel. And so in method one, we'd have this first equation telling us the marginal rate of substitution equals the ratio of the prices. And our second equation is going to be some kind of representation of a budget line equation. The second method that is commonly used to solve these problems is a Lagrangian maximization problem. And this is basically what that setup would look like. You either know that or you need to go watch some of my other videos where I go through those things. So nothing here yet is an intertemporal utility maximization problem if we're talking about X and Y being two different goods. Let's change the interpretation of what we have here then. Let's suppose that instead of X and Y being two different goods, let's suppose that X is present consumption and Y is future consumption. So we just need some kind of way to capture your lifetime utility for consuming either now or in the future. So a lot of times people will describe this as period one would be the present and period two would be the future here. We could use a Cobb-Douglas kind of utility function for this, or another common way that this might be set up is to introduce the idea of a discount rate. And a discount rate is simply the idea of, normally we think about preferring things now more than later. So if we were to measure, we could do this with a survey, for example, we could ask people, which would you rather have? Would you rather have $1 now, or would you rather have $1 next year, right? Say at the end of this period. So we could just say tomorrow, whatever that means. Just about everybody is going to say, I'll, I'll take the dollar now for a lot of reasons. Now, if we wanted to measure a discount rate, we would just have to keep asking people a series of questions and keep increasing this amount that people might get tomorrow and say, okay, which would you rather have a dollar now or a dollar uh, 50 tomorrow? And somebody might say, well, I, I still want a dollar now. Okay, well, let's increase the amount of money that we're going to give people tomorrow, $1.75. And maybe people say, oh, okay, well, now I'm indifferent. Right now I'm indifferent between these two things. Everybody's going to be different, but maybe if someone said a dollar now is equivalent to a dollar 75 tomorrow, this gives us an idea of their discount rate. So there are two ways that you can write down this idea of a discount rate. Uh, one we call a discount rate, the other we call a discount factor. A discount rate, it, usually people will use a a letter like P or Rho here, and it's the idea that we want to find some number P such that a dollar now equals some amount in the future, right, some future amount, divided by 1 plus P, right? And so if this future amount is $1.75, 
that would mean that this P here equals the 0.75. So it's kind of like a 75% rate of interest is what we would need to keep us indifferent between these two things. So you can think about this as, as kind of equivalent to an interest rate, but for, for utility to be used for discounting. Another way that sometimes we'll talk about discounting is as a discount factor, and a discount factor is just to say, look, let's just look at this 1 over 1.75 and see, well, what is that number? And we get about 0.57, all right? So about 0.57, that's what we would call the discount factor, which tells us that a dollar in the future is going to be perceived in, in utility terms as roughly only worth 57 cents would be today, okay? So discount rate, discount factor. So instead of having a Cobb-Douglas utility function, another common way people would do it is to, just to say, look, let's, let's have the idea that uh, our utility is just equal to the square root of how much ever consumption you have in that period. But in the future, we're going to have to multiply that utility. So u is going to, in the future, is going to be, say, 1 over 1 plus this discount rate times the square root of consumption. And the further you go in the future, you, the more you have to raise this to a power. So how many time periods in the future is it? Okay. Let's just stick with, with a simple case. So we could, you know, it might make more sense in some cases to say, well, if we're going to believe in this idea of discounting, we probably would want to choose a different exponent for the future that might be a little lower if we were going to use this Cobb-Douglas idea. Okay, let's go ahead and do that. Let's just assume here that our form of discounting we're going to use is to maybe have 0.6 as an exponent for the present and 0.4 for the future, right? That tells us that consumption in the future is not as valuable. Another thing that we probably want to build into the, the simplest yet interesting model of present versus future consumption is an explicit interest rate. So when we say that we have a budget of $100,000, what does that really mean when we're talking about two periods? Okay, well, the simplest kind of situation would be to say, look, here's, our, here's sort of our budget, but that's not really the case. Let's suppose in these two periods, present and future, that we have income in only one period. So let's suppose this is our present income, $100,000. And in the future, we're going to be retired, so we will have no income at all in the future. So right now, we have $100,000, and we have to decide how are we going to spend that, some today, some in the future. And talking about prices here doesn't necessarily make sense, because we're just talking about spending money. But at the same time, let's talk, you know, let's talk about an interest rate and how that's going to affect our budget equation here. The idea here being that if we don't, for every dollar that we don't spend today, if we spend a dollar today, it's gone, and it's just worth a dollar. But if we save it, for every dollar that we save in the future, that's going to turn into a dollar times 1 plus r, whatever the interest rate is. So let's think about how to build that into our budget equation so that we can keep track of how much we're allowed to spend here. Let's spend a minute to think through this budget line and what, it, what it's going to look like. Let's think about how much money we're going to have to spend in the future. Why? That's going to have to be equal to $100,000 minus how much money we spent in the present. So how much money will we have left after we spend money in the present? That's going to, that's X. Well, we're going to have $100,000 minus X left. 
However, for each of those dollars we don't spend in the present period, we're going to earn some interest on, right? We're going to earn 1 plus R. Let's think about rewriting this so that it looks a little bit more like what we what we think of as a budget line, right? This, this equation will, will certainly work. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. But let's rewrite this. Uh, basically, isolating that $100,000 like we have here. Well, let's divide both sides by that 1 plus R term here. So we'll get, end up with Y over 1 plus the interest rate equals $100,000 minus X. And then all we have to do is add X to both sides. So here we have X plus Y over 1 plus R equals $100,000. And this is typically how you would write this kind of budget equation for an intertemporal utility maximization problem. I just went through that extra step here to show you why this is how you can actually write these. So let's replace our budget line that we have up here with this version. Let's just move it up here. And let's go ahead and assume an interest rate for this problem. Let's assume that the interest rate is, say, 50%. Okay, so 50%. So if for every dollar we save, we're going to be able to have 50%, or let's, let's call that 0.5, more money next period. So if we plug that in here, that's going to be 1 plus R is simply going to be 1.5. Now let me re rewrite this one more time. Another, another way that might be interesting to look at this is to say, look, let's think about it this way. X plus 1 over 1.5 times Y. So 0.66666667 or 2 thirds. Yeah, let's just write it as 2 thirds. 2 thirds Y equals $100,000. Now what's useful about writing it this way is you get to see kind of the opportunity cost between the two. Here we have 1x. You can think about that as the price of spending a dollar today. The price of spending a dollar tomorrow is only two-thirds of a dollar. It costs less to spend money tomorrow than today because you're earning interest. Okay, enough of that. Let's look at this budget line real quickly. Let me graph it real quick so that we can visualize what we're looking at for people who are graphically inclined. So let's, uh, here I am in Maple, and I'll uh, include a link to this Maple worksheet if you want to play with it. So our utility function, x to the point 0.4 times y to the point 0.6, our budget constraint, x plus y over 1.5 equals $100,000. Let's plot this budget constraint here. So here in, in our X and Y space, you see that if we spend no money today, we could spend $150,000 in the future. If we spend all of our money today, we'll be able to spend $100,000 today and none in the future, okay? So this slope tells us, again, that opportunity cost between spending today and spending in the future. What's the trade-off look like? Let's solve this problem and see what's the optimum amount that we should spend in the present and what's the optimum amount we should save for the future in this problem. So again, we have, we have two standard methods here. Number one would just be to say, look at the marginal rate of substitution, which is the price of X over the price of Y. And that's why I took the time to look at this way of writing the budget constraint because this is like the price of X is one, this is like the price of Y. So if you wanted to use the sort of non-Lagrangian method, marginal rate of substitution, using the shortcut method for this Cobb-Douglas production function is gonna be 0.6Y over 0.4X. Again, that's just what you get if you simplify the marginal utility partial derivative of utility with respect to x divided by the marginal utility of y, partial derivative with respect to y, and set that equal to the ratio of the price of x divided by the price of y, two-thirds. 
So that's our first equation. Second equation would be this budget line equation. And by solving those two equations for two unknowns, you'll be able to get the optimum amount. For those of you who pre prefer the Lagrangian method, we'd take the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to x. So let's just write that out here. Our utility function is x to the point 6 times y to the point 4 plus lambda times $100,000. Make a little bit more room there. All right, $100,000 minus 1 times the price of x minus 2 thirds times y. And you take three derivatives here, partial derivative with respect to x. It's going to be 0.6x to the minus 0.4 times y to the 0.4 plus lambda times, since that's with x, this x is going to, going to be minus lambda. And derivative with respect to y, 0.4y to the minus 0.6 times x to the 0.6 minus two-thirds lambda. And then when you take the derivative here with respect to lambda, you just get that budget constraint. $100,000 minus x minus two-thirds y equals zero. And if you solve this, you're just, you know, for either x or y or the $100,000, you're just going to get exactly the same thing as our budget constraint over there. So take a minute and solve this. And I'll come back and show you the answers I got. Wow, these <laughs> values that I chose here for the exponents and the prices lead us to a very simple conclusion here that y equals x. And then we can substitute that into the budget line equation up here any way we want. Let's just say that here we have, let's put substitute x equals y here. So here we're going to have 1y equals plus, sorry, plus two-thirds y equals $100,000, or five-thirds y equals $100,000. Just divide $100,000 by five-thirds, and we get that we want to spend $60,000 in the future, and we want to spend then $60,000 in the present since y equals x. First, let's just verify that this is a valid answer. Let's just look at the, the budget constraint here. This is the kind of thing that I always want to go through as soon as I solve something, just say, is, could this possibly be correct? Looking at X and Y here, what we're saying is that if we spend $60,000 in period one, we're going to have $40,000 left over, right? And then what, what are we going to do with that? We put it in the bank and we earn 50% interest on it, right? So we're going to end up with one and a half times as much. And sure enough, that leaves us $60,000 that we can spend in the future. Let's look at this in a indifference curve picture really quickly here. We just realized that I had these exponents messed up here. Sorry. So let's uh, recreate our little plot here. It's going to look similar, except it's just kind of reversed. All right, so let's change the style here to contour, turn it around, and now let's look and see what that looks like when we draw our budget line in. All right, so here's our indifference curve map, and I've drawn in that budget line that we were looking at before. So if we spend all our money in the future, 150000 today, only 100000 and so the, the method, again, kind of the, the intermediate micro typical method you would use without calculus, just says we're looking for a point where the slope of this budget line is equal to the slope of an indifference curve. Now, we don't see the exact indifference curve that we're looking for in this picture, but, you know, there are an infinite number of these things, and there's going to be another indifference curve that goes roughly, looks like these other ones, that cuts through here. And you can see that the slopes are roughly equal with that budget line and these indifference curves around that neighborhood there. And so our point that we found was spend $60,000 
today, $60,000 tomorrow, and all of the typical intuitions that you would have in a, an atemporal or, or non-temporal kind of utility maximization problem should hold. So for, for example, suppose the interest rate went up. What would we expect to happen here? Well, if the interest rate went up, that would mean that if we spend less today, we will have even more in the future. And that would shift this, sorry, not shift, but twist, really, this budget line to where it's going to have a steeper slope if that interest rate goes up, right? So imagine the interest rate went up to something around, oh, 200 and something percent here, right? So that would mean that our solution would be something more like this where we might spend $60,000 today, but spend even more in the future because that interest rate is higher, right? Then we could afford to spend, say, $90,000 perhaps in the future. And of course, we would have higher utility with that. So I guess the last thing let's do with this introduction, lengthy introduction to intertemporal utility maximization, is let's calculate how much utility this person would actually get in this case if they spend $60,000 on Y and $60,000 on X. And that quite obviously, in this case, since the exponents here add to one, is going to be $60,000 to the 0.4 to the 60,000 dollars, sorry, to the 0.6, $60,000 to the 0.4, and that's just going to equal 60,000 in utility here, since those exponents add to one, not a lot of calculating to do. So in the next video, we'll look at some changes to this. What if we added some taxes to this? Or what if we had forced saving through some kind of government program where the government taxed your income uh, at a certain rate and then paid you interest on that in the future? is sort of a social security scheme is what we might call it in the United States. So join me for that video and we'll do two interesting twists on intertemporal utility problems involving forced savings and tax rates. See you then.